Um, so let's now explore in this session, we're looking at the green transition. Now, I know that for many uh, people, the, the full impact, the carbon footprint of the health sector is not so clear. So let me invite two speakers who are going to join me in person. I have a, a speaker who's joining me online. But let me invite Sonia Roshik, the Executive Director for the Geneva Sustainability Centre, to join me on stage, and Sir Kieran Devane, the Chair of the Irish Health Service Executive, to join me. Now, let's, let's start by uh, understanding we've just had COP27, um, where countries were expected to make more and more ambitious commitments. Um, the the 1.5 degree of warming target is just about still alive, although we were told it's on life support. So the health sector has a role to play in it. It's going to be heavily affected by climate change, but we, really, we also need to understand what's our role in it. And so, Sonia, let me invite you to give us a first perspective to understand, you know, what is it that we need, what is it that we need to know? What's our starting point and where, where do we think, start thinking when we use the word greening our health system? Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. And I, I guess there's two starting points. One is that climate change is a health issue. It's inherently about our health. It's not just about the environment. We can't have healthy people on an unhealthy planet. So the quicker we realize that this is a health issue and therefore should be integrated into everything we do in healthcare, the better. The other one is the size. We know now, thanks to The Lancet, and I know we'll um, hear from Marina later, that 5.2% of, of global emissions are from healthcare. It is bigger than shipping and aviation put together. So this is an industry that matters, and we need to do something about it. We often forget to consider the healthcare sector as an industry, and that's all of you in the room here, from industry to politicians to healthcare providers and policymakers. And what I'd like to say about that is that you know, um, everybody has got a role to play because there are so many areas where we'll need to transform. It is about transformation. And if you model ourselves to 2050, like um, we've just been um, encouraged to do, and often this is not something we are very good at in healthcare, because you know the future is sometimes tomorrow or, or or this afternoon, we know that these emissions could treble. So this is not something that's going to go away. It's an impending crisis that is already with us, and that we need to do something about. And because um, the way it's been talked about, we need to not only understand the data, but we also need to start thinking about what that means for the way we deliver healthcare. And we've talked a lot this morning about the fact that if we can focus on health rather than sickness, we can start that transformation. And that's absolutely critical. If you can reduce admi admissions because they're not needed, you can also reduce emissions. So not using stuff and not using products because we don't need them is absolutely key to that. So the personalization agenda we've heard about, the AI agenda can contribute to it, but my plea to you is can we also integrate the green agenda because otherwise we'll get it completely wrong. Um, I think I'm gonna leave it there because I know that we are tight for time and I could go on forever. Uh, thank you, I'm, I'm just allowing that to sink in that the emissions from the health sector are more than aviation and shipping combined. Now, we know that we've got people protesting outside airports because of the aviation emissions. Now, I'm not suggesting that we have people protesting outside our health system because we already have that challenge with vaccines, but this, this is a huge headline news. And I think it would be a surprise to many people. It was in our briefing call, it was quite a shock to me. I, in the back of my mind, I kind of thought, yeah, energy, we use a lot of it, a lot of waste, but I had no idea that it was at that level. Um, and, and clearly, I know that um, many health professionals and health sectors declared a climate emergency uh, last year um, at COP. So you know, what are the starting actions? What, what's, we need to be first out of the block at EU and national level. What's your best advice? So my best advice is to get started now on some no regret measures. Yes, we've got to measure our footprint and reduce it, but you can spend two years trying to perfect that and waste two years. So my concept is get started now. There's a lot of things that we know we can do now 
that will, are, are going to be of no regret. You know, you can reduce waste, you can prescribe better, you can focus on health and well-being, you can support health professionals to be empowered to make decisions closer to patients. There is so much you can do. Um, I mean, of course, there's all the energy efficiency, there's all the, the you know, transport, buildings, food. But I like, I, as we're a healthcare audience here, I'd like to call you to think about the things that are specific to healthcare. You know, so medicines, med tech, how we deliver models of care that are low carbon and resilient because we need to develop resilience at the same time because, you know, we had heat waves this summer in uh, Europe which are going to be difficult to deal with. So we need to grapple with these issues and the only way to do it is to integrate them and transform them. And it's going to require all of us in the room to collaborate to find the right innovations. This is an innovation summit. We're going to need plenty of innovation for this. Thank you, Sonia. Kieran, let me uh, invite you to come in because in Ireland you've got a brand new strategy uh, and plans for green healthcare. Can you take us through through that plan and what enabled you to do it right in the middle of all of these other multi poly crises that health's trying to do it? How did you find that clear space to do it? Um, thank you and nice to be here. Um, the first thing is the government told us to do it. <clears throat> um, so all public bodies legally have to produce a plan um, to eliminate fossil fuel heating by 2024 to, um, and you can argue about whether this is ambitious enough, but to have a 51% reduction in um, carbon footprint by 2030 and be carbon neutral by 2050. So we all have a duty. So you're, you're right that we have a new strategy. In fact, it's so new that we um, actually launched it on Friday. So. Um, the, but it was this thing around um, saying, let's not spend two years analysing. We know that there are things we can get on and do. So the way we're seeing the problem is we've divided it into six tasks that we have to do. There are six things we need to worry about. The first is um, buildings and the environment around them. So healthcare is huge, as we know. You know it, invariably, healthcare is the largest employer in a country, quite often the biggest employer in a town. Um, we have big buildings, they're often old. You know, our head office is an 18th century hospital. Um, they are not designed to be eco-friendly. So the first thing to do is sort of have a program saying, what are we going to do about our infrastructure and our buildings? The second one is transport and mobility. You know, again, we are the, you know, if you take us, we're the largest employer in the state by um, a large factor. Um, lots of people travel into work, lots of people come and obviously visit uh, healthcare settings. Um, how we do that and how we integrate into transport is really important for our, um, our carbon footprint. The next one is we're big purchasers. W you know, the biggest cost in healthcare, as we know, is workforce, but actually we're still, despite that, we're still huge purchasers in any uh, economy. So therefore we have an obligation to work with our supply chain to how, you know, work out how do we make the supply chain greener. Um, the next one is water and waste management. Um, we, you know, we're big consumers of water. Most hospitals have an incinerator. You know, how good is it? How old is it? What should it be doing? What needs to be incinerated? What, what doesn't? And then the two biggest ones, I think, or the two which will be the biggest challenges are, first of all, what are those greener models of healthcare? Now, we will never get anywhere if we say, we're not going to give you the best care, but we've got this nice green one we're going to give you. Um, so it's actually around finding what are the models of care which do both. Now, fortunately, the big challenges in healthcare are the aging population. Um, you know, we, we, you know, we know that life expectancy goes up one year every four years. Um, so we have a huge population um, emerging of older people who are healthier than their cohorts of five years ago, ten years ago, but the, num you know, the population of 85-year-olds will still be hu huge consumers of healthcare. They do not want to be in hospital. All the evidence is that's bad for the outcomes. So therefore, what are the greener models of healthcare that support people to be at home which allows us to deliver care through AI, through remote monitoring, through whatever it is, 
um, allow us to, to do that. Now, one advantage we have is we're not just the healthcare system, we're also the social care provider for the country, you know, purchaser at least. Um, so that integration is going to be incredibly important. And then the last one is the adaptation and resilience. So it's the impact that climate change will have on us. You know, what hospitals are going to be flooded? What ones are in, um, you know, places which, um, you know, are vulnerable for whatever reason? So it's those six topics um, we think are the major ones. Um, but I, if I can pick up again on this point about getting started, we, we have what we, co um, what we call shallow interventions, you know, replacing the light bulbs with LED lights. So you can do that. And collectively, across the largest employer in the state, that will make a big difference. But the, what we're calling the deeper interventions around the installation, around the, um, the, de the design of HVAC systems, you know, what temperature does the hospital really need to be at, as opposed to the fact that we all set them at a high temperature because we think that's good for people. Um, so those ones will take a lot longer. So you can get started. You do have to be structured. We do have this role um, as, as a kind of a beacon public organisation because if healthcare doesn't get it right, you can be pretty sure the other health um, public bodies aren't going to get it right as well. And the government told us to. Thank you very much. I mean, you're definitely a man with a plan. And I, I found it interesting. I mean, uh, Sonia, you talked about no regret interventions. Kieran, you've talked about shallow interventions. But the clear message is coming through is start. You know, act now. Don't be paralysed by waiting for that. You know, the final perfect solution. And and Kieran, you also highlighted that in in healthcare, what people want is the best. And if there is any concern that what they're offered is not the best because we're trying to meet some other green uh, objective, clearly we are going to meet resistance both by the patients and the practitioners. So it's a process where we have to bring people along. I'd like to introduce our, our final panellist, that's Marina Rom Romanello from the Lancet Climate Countdown, who's joining us online. Hi, Ren Marina. Hello, thank you so much for having me. And I'm sorry I cannot be there with you in person. I would love to be there, actually. It looks like a very nice room for the people. It's a, it's a great room and we're a very lively crowd. So what, what I want to ask you, and we touched on that a little bit, is you know health systems are currently in a crisis, but you know what? I've worked in health policy for 20 years and there's never been a time when there hasn't been a crisis of one type or another. So you know how do we um, build in dealing with the climate crisis along with everything else? We heard from our first two speakers that actually they're connected and you know, delivering green and sustainable care is also part of the health system transformation. But let's build up the evidence on that. Yeah, so the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us uh, just how frail our health systems are globally uh, in countries where we have very strong health systems. Even then, uh, we, we struggled a fair amount with the COVID-19 pandemic and we saw the strain on healthcare. And I think that's offered a bit of a glimpse of what it means to have overwhelmed health systems. And what we're seeing with climate change is obviously the health impacts of climate change are increasing really rapidly. We're seeing multidimensional and compounding impacts from climate change, uh, anything from extreme weather events that put acute pressure on our health systems, but also increases in um, non-communicable diseases that come from, from climate risks and from our exposure to unhealthy environments associated with uh, fossil fuel burnings and to, to climate change itself, and an increased incidence of infectious diseases as well, all putting further strain on our health systems. And all of us, our projections show that that will increase. So I think the learnings from the COVID-19 pandemic is just how much we need functional, resilient, robust health systems and how frail they still are. So it's undeniable that we will need to strengthen our health systems, but what is important is to understand that um, tackling climate change can be conceived through healthcare as mitigation or, or reduction of climate change that is essentially primary prevention. We need to avoid this increase in health impacts by uh, reducing our chances of the worst case scenario of increasing uh, climate change and the associated impacts that it will have and the strain on our health systems. And then on the other hand, we have climate adaptation strengthening our health systems, um, empowering them to respond and to be able to cope with this increased hazard as secondary prevention. And all of that needs to go closely hand in hand, obviously with reducing our footprints from the health systems. And it can be compatible 
And the, the most efficient way of reducing our carbon footprint is keeping people off hospitals because they don't need as much care. And that can be achieved through primary prevention, through more efficient pathways of care, as we already heard, by enabling people to get care at home where they're comfortable and reducing the demands because we're tackling the problem at root, minimizing our uh, impact on the environment, the negative exposures that we have to all of these uh, environmental hazards and strengthening our capacity to respond. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I, I want to come back to you, to Kieran, because when I was talking to Sonia yesterday, she said something very clearly, and, and Marina's reinforced that, which is admissions to hospital drive emissions. So the, the focus is actually we know it's quite poor for health outcomes to people to spend time in hospitals, and it is driving up our carbon footprint. So. Um, Part of the challenge, and, you, and you, Kieran, you said there's a trade-off. People don't want to think they're going to get second-class health care, even if it might be good for the planet. And we also know that hospital care is not necessarily the best way to provide care, but people see their local hospital as an intrinsic part of their community. Their local hospital is the physical, pr physical presence of the welfare state. So if you start telling people that you're going to close down hospitals or reduce hospital presence because they could get care at home or telehealth or something else, that's really quite a challenging conversation. Is there anything you can share with us about some the experience that you have of trying to take this conversation to the population? Um, it's a very, very difficult one. Um, the public does not like the local accident and emergency emergency department to be shut down, even if you tell them you're going to get you're more likely to survive if you go to the hospital 20 kilometers away. The what we've been finding is that the best solution is to build something else which is even closer to them. So primary care centers. Uh, sometimes they don't have to be physical. The we're putting in multidisciplinary teams of physios, occupational therapists, speech and language therapists, for every footprint of 50,000 people in the country. So every population will have its, its own team. And what we're trying to do is to link that with the local GP practices and talk them up yeah. so that the association isn't with the flagship hospital in the big city. It's with their local um, health system. But but that innate resistance to closing um, what we know are acute services which are much better delivered. You know, who wants to be operated by the surgeon who only does one operation a year? But the public isn't there in most places, in most countries. And um, so you have to build the alternative and you have to show the alternative is better first. Um, it doesn't mean you're running two parallel systems, it just says you have to bring the public with you, because mostly we live in democracies. Thank you. Sonia, do you want to comment on that as well? I saw you nodding at some of the things that, that Kieran was talking about, which is you know shifting the emphasis and the, the delivery and, and uh, a broader range of services more available to you locally, and that that is one of the ways to help people make that transition. What can you share? So it's music to my ears because I'm an occupational therapist by training. So I naturally um, have always had to straddle the social and healthcare piece. And it's always been difficult because they sort of sit under two different leaderships. And so I'm delighted they're under the same one in Ireland. But just to, to reinforce the fact that we can, um, you know, patients do expect us, and we know this from some work that's been done in the UK, they think that we're already delivering sustainable services. Now that is scary, it's you know, taxpayers' money, but they think that we're already doing it because we look after resources well, because we are trustworthy professionals. Now that's incredibly humbling because we've got a long way to go. And I think there's something about engaging with patients and with um, citizens on what the future looks like. We heard earlier that we are consumers, citizens and patients, all of three at the same time. We all have a role to play on all those three fronts. And it is difficult when you're going for a cataract operation to say, actually, do I really need to have it done here or, what, or have a conversation around it? But I think there are models of care that have demonstrated you know, better quality of care as, at the end of it, better results, 
um, and actually higher patient satisfaction. And just to name one, because I think it contrasts with the A&E example, because at the moment we sort of say to everybody, come to A&E and you'll be seen in four hours. You know, and, it's, and, then we, and then we've got this log of people who don't actually need to be there, who think they're going to get good care, but they're not going to, and, and it's channeling them into a hospital admission. And you know, if you look at Kaiser Permanente, where they are both the payer and the insurer, they know it's worth investing a lot of money up front to keep people well and keep people healthy, and they've declared an emergency, a failure of their system. Now, wouldn't that be something different if we could integrate that into our way of delivering care. So we do need to shift the models. We need to be creative about it because it's not saying let's close A&E. It's about something quite different and something much better. And I think that's what get, I was asked today, what keeps me positive. It is exactly this transformation because I've got the passion that we can do it. Thank you. Let me open the floor for, for interventions. This is an area that they, the health community may not uh, deal with in a lot of detail. And we, we heard from Kieran the six areas that uh, they're looking at nationally. It's the buildings and infrastructure, it's the transport and mobility, the supply chain, the water and waste management, um, how to make healthcare green and effective outcomes, and the adaptation and resilience. So that's a long shopping list of things for people to think about when they're already covering budget shortages, health workshop for shortages, waiting lists, etc. But it's absolutely critical and part of the shift in care. So yes, we will get a, a, mic, a microphone to Andre. And would anyone else like to to make an intervention? Yes, please stand up. Uh, okay. Uh, the question to Irish government. <laughs> so first, how you measure this? What is your? Because I did, sorry, I didn't see the program that was published last Friday, so I have to, I, I will have a look. Uh, even yesterday, okay. Uh, so this is the first question. How you measure this? What are the kind of uh, indicators you incorporate in the, in the program? And the second, you know, uh, what is the investment? You know, who, who is going to pay for this? And how much, of course. Yes. I have. And just before you answer, Kieran, let me take El Elina as well. You had a question. Stand up, so we, that's it. Well, thank you. It's also a comment. I just wanted to advertise a little bit. We have been talking also about the prevention, and Lupna also identified the possibilities for the AI to, to pick out the risk groups and, and have more targeted actions uh, in, at the earlier stage. Uh, in Finland, we actually have one uh, planetary health doctor already that is focusing on these preventative actions. But it's just one at this stage, but I think it, it's showing also example that we are getting there. We are making transitions and transformations in how we think about healthcare and health. It's not only about treating the disease and prescribing drugs and treatments, but how can we make it proactively about the citizens and their health? Thank you, Alina. Yes, we'll another lady in green. We've obviously got the same memo today. Please stand up. Great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I have also a question for Ireland. Sorry. Um, it's very impressive, your plan, um, and I hope many countries will follow. Uh, but I was wondering on the supply chain side, because I have often heard the difficulty of imposing that because of, in order to comply as a provider, you need to somehow be certified and that there is a difficulty there in order to be certified as a green. So I was wondering how you are tackling that because it can be used as a, oh, let's not go that road because in any case we cannot have a certainty that the supplier is, is green. So I would like to, to know more. Thank you. Thank you. So, Kieran, there you go. Oh, um, the, we've started with people. Um, we've put in energy efficiency offices around the system. They have teams. We identified the, um, the high priority energy users who use 75% of the, the energy. Um, so, we we've, we've started kind of by building a, a, a light infrastructure, maybe 60 million euros worth of activity so that we had people in place who could do two things. One is gather that data, but the second thing is get those early initiatives in place to focus on the low-hanging fruit in the cliche around it. Um, so we have, just looking at the numbers, we have 11 energy efficiency officers in the system working with three regional teams around the country. So we, we put in um, a bureaucracy, really, in the 
nice sense of bureaucracy to, to do that so that we had the ongoing monitoring and we can tell you that our energy is 13% lower than the baseline um, two years in. Um, the certification of the supply chain, the, the, there are some things which um, are already, in inverted commas, certified. You know, we, none of us support the greenwashing um, idea. The, what, we're, what we're doing is we're saying, actually structuring the conversations with the suppliers, and rather than saying, give us a certificate, it's saying, what can you do to reduce our carbon footprint and yours, and then coming up with procurement plans. So I don't think we're really focusing on certification, to be honest. I think we're saying, um, you know, we're measuring our carbon footprint, are you measuring yours? Um, and oh, by the way, how much of the single-use things do we really need uh, in the supply chain? So some of it is the boring stuff. It's, you know, it, I don't really mean this literally, but it's the pens, it's the paper, it's the concrete blocks, it's the, you know, it's not, it's not the MRI scanner um, that uh, we're focusing on. It's the rest, because you know, most of what we procure is boring. Thank you. Sonia, and then I'll come to you, Marina, to uh, add in. Yeah. Thank you. So I just wanted to say, because we, we know that so much of um, the carbon emissions are in the supply chain, but, it, but the mistake we sometimes make is thinking it's a supply chain issue, therefore, only. But actually, we are the ones who use the products and choose to use them, and, and how we use them matters hu hugely. So we don't necessarily need to... I mean, we waste an awful lot in the way we use things. And there's a wonderful case study in the UK around the use of gloves, where they managed by raising awareness with nurses just to reduce the number of non-surgical gloves that were used, which was good for nurses' hands. It was good for... They saved a lot of money. They saved a lot of um, carbon emissions. And, you know, actually, patients were happier not being treated with gloves. They weren't necessary. It had become a habit. And I think there are... What I would plead to is, yes, we need to think about how we can work best with the supply chain, and it's a really important thing to do, and if we can do it collectively, we can make a bigger difference. But we also need to think about how we can just reduce waste and use our resources more wisely, because there is, and on the money front, there's quite a lot of money to be had in actually just doing that well. Thank you. Marina, can I bring you in uh, on an issue because you, you looked at the global countdown and of course in Europe we have incredibly developed health systems, whereas in other parts of the world we know they're on the trajectory of hopefully building health systems. So what do we, that tells me that the, the emissions profile of the health sector globally is likely to rise. Is that inevitable? Is there anything that we can do that could ensure that when other parts of the world build up their health systems, they don't end up massively increasing our emissions? Is there a cleaner, safer path for others? Yeah, there definitely is. And as you said, there's uh, many parts of the world in which the health systems are still growing and they need to grow to provide proper care and the care that people need. Um, but it's very interesting because when we look at Europe, when we look at the higher income countries, the health systems are highly carbon intensive. Whereas if you look perhaps at lower income countries, the health systems have much lower carbon intensity. And even if we compare that with the quality of care provided, there's much more efficient countries. Um, Europe in general performs quite well. Most countries perform really well, but there's still uh, a big scope of countries that provide excellent care with very wide ranging uh, levels of carbon intensity. So even today, we know that we could provide excellent care being much more um, efficient in the way that we use res resources. Sonia just mentioned the example of gloves. That's a great example our unnecessary overuse of PPE um, is one area in which kind of countries that have more resources or, or high income countries tend to overuse and overspend uh, because they can afford it uh, economically, but perhaps not so much uh, environmentally. So there's a lot of learnings from lower income settings on how we can be much more effective in our use of resources. And aside from that, it's also worth mentioning that this transition of healthcare, it cannot be done by one health system alone. We talked a lot about supply chain just now. Uh, the global health system, uh, as we heard from Sonia, our research shows that it's responsible for about 5% of all global greenhouse gas emissions. But it's also responsible for about 10% of global GDP. So actually, our power, including in our supply chain, 
over changing the way that everything is delivered, not only uh, pharmaceuticals, but we heard about pens, we heard about a, a kind of stationary. The health system is really big in what it encompasses. So it has an enormous power to change um, how, how other industries also behave. And what we're seeing, for example, here in England is the NHS in England has taken the commitment of not buying from any supplier that does not at least match their climate commitments. And as the biggest single supplier of healthcare, it has an enormous power over the international markets of healthcare providers. And what it has seen is the private sector starting to come along and starting to match the commitments of the NHS, and that generates ripple effects. And the huge benefit of that, as we also heard just now, is that by uh, clustering, by generating these demands from health systems around the world, we can generate a shift in the whole industry. And naturally, as we do that, and as we start decarbonizing the way that we provide healthcare, the new health systems or the health systems that are growing will come along that trajectory. So there's a lot that has kind of these cascading effects and is being led by mainly uh, kind of the decarbonizing efforts of um, perhaps in Europe, many of the, of the health systems here taking the lead on that. Thank you, Marina. Sonia, let me come to you and, and ask a question. At the moment, we measure the effectiveness and performance of our health systems by health outcomes. We measure the, the sort of financial inputs and the health outcomes. And we, we tend to think that Europe does quite well. In its, that's how we measure value for money. But how would we integrate some kind of metric at looking at our green and our carbon footprints? Do you think that that should be part of the way that we measure performance of health systems? So I, I totally do believe it should be integrated and that we have, you know, a sort of triple bottom line where you might have a environmental impacts. I'd just widen it beyond just carbon. There's a number of other environmental impacts we could be measuring. There's the economic um, ones and there's some social ones as well as health outcomes. I think there's something about looking at it across the board. The, the beauty, as we've sort of discussed today, is that some of these measures are, you know, if you start improving them, they can be a win-win-win across all those measures. And I just, I'm going to just divert that question and come back to it a bit, because I know we're talking about the savings you can make and, and the changes you can make. The health professionals that I've spoken to, they are quite willing to change because of greenness, as opposed to because it's going to save money. So the gloves example, or anaesthetists, they're doing it not because they think they're going to save their hospital money. They're doing it because they fundamentally believe that this is better for the environment and better for society. So this, in terms of the behavioral change, is quite a piece about knowing what language we speak. But yes, I, I do believe we need to have um, much better ways of integrating the measurement. And I think what it will drive us is to this new economics that we've been talking about last night and today, where actually, and be it driven by data or by something else, where we're not going to be paying per product or per activity, but paying for the outcomes. And we need to get really clever at what that looks like. My only plea is let's not wait until we've absolutely nailed it on the head to make it happen. Let's start introducing it. Um, you know, like Lubna said, because we've got good data, because that will help to drive some of those changes. Thank you. And Kieran, I'm, I'm going to come to you as the last intervention in, in this uh, session. To, you, you're responsible for the health executive, the health service executive, and yet what we're talking about is as part of this transformation of health systems, it's almost as if we're dissolving away health system as expensive hospitals and, and turning it into something that is locally based, it's integrated, it's a series of services and tools that surround people. In this approach to transforming our health system in the Green Deal, you know, do you see your job as essentially making it redundant to run hospitals, to have this big infrastructure? You know, how much of a, a radical rethink should we be looking at? Um, I, I don't think it's about making hospitals redundant, but it's about making sure that only things that must take place in a hospital take place in them. Because a lot of things can take place elsewhere, or if you get it right, don't need to take place at all. I. The, the model of health that we have in, across Europe is effectively a post-war construct. And it was right when the, the, the idea was something happens to you, you go and get it fixed, you break a leg, you go to hospital, you have an infection, you go to the GP. They fix you and you go home. 
populations now, most of it isn't that. It's you know the 85-year-old with multiple conditions who is not going to be fixed, but it is about helping them live life as well as possible in that context. We are, we are not designed for that. So the radical shift for me, if we ignore climate for a moment, is to say, how do we do more upfront prevention? How do we do long-term management of conditions? And um, how do we support people to be well and at home? So what's the home care package as much as what is the admissions policy? Um, so I think we have to fundamentally redesign our health systems because the system we had has been brilliantly successful. You know, we, we, you know, average life expectancy is north of 80 um, across Europe. That wasn't true in 19, you know, 50. But we are designed for the wrong thing. So we have to tot not tear it up, but we have to know we're, we're heading for a completely different destination. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to draw this, this panel to a close. So thank you to Sonia, to Kieran, and to Marina. And uh, the, my reflections here are that it's, it's about a direction of travel. And I think all day we've been talking about a direction of travel of where we need to go. And you've added a whole level of both complexity, but also simplification. The things we need to think about and take into account are more complex. But there's the simplicity of we're looking at outcomes and the best outcomes for individuals. And sometimes that will be in health systems. Sometimes it's supported in the home and in the community and with tools that help keep them healthy. I think that's a really effective message. Um, and we, we need to, to be aware, and I think we'll talk about that in our next session when we talk about the reality of the changing shift in our population, who they are and how we deliver care and how we support them. So I'd like to say a warm thank you to Sonia, to Kieran and to Marina. <laughs>